I have spoken to eyewitnesses, and a lot of them have said that they were. But then <laughs> a lot of them actually got shot. I don't know how drunk people could be. Well, uh, what I mean so is that they were either on drunk, they were either drunk or they were on some type of drug. So they were on some substance that encouraged their their moral, what have you. <laughs> this is not a horror film. Are those the phantoms <laughs> coming back from the dead to uh, get us? I can't repeat it. No. There we go. <laughs> 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 You chose poorly. God. It's so eerie. <laughs> That's very. Oh, intense. I forgot to do this last episode. <laughs> yeah. You know what that is? It's just they open the piano up and they yeah. kind of randomly skitter across the string. Have you seen that moment? Or have you seen the Count of Monte Cristo the movie? Oh yeah. There's this great scene where they the table is not set and then they ring dinner and then there's like twelve servants who just plop a bunch of plates down. <laughs> And uh, anyway, Yako Boko there, there he goes, hits his gong. I'm like, I want that. It's like, kids, ready? Wong. <laughs> Sit down for your chicken nuggets. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. We need to inject some high society into this. Oh, my favorite quotes comes from that movie, man. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm a preacher, not a saint? Yeah, that one, that one right there. <laughs> no, it's a, I've quoted this from the pulpit before. Um, I think it might be in the book as well, but I haven't read the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, um, um, what is it? Oh yeah. Okay. Life is a storm. My son, you'll bask in the sunlight one moment and be shattered on the rocks the next. But what makes you a man is what you do when that storm comes. Mm. Um, I don't remember that at all from the movie. Yeah, what well, did he say that? He stands up at the dinner party. Oh, when he gives the toast and he's looking at his son. Wow. I was checking out that, there. That's what he says at the toast. That's amazing. Yeah. And he, he gives him such high praise. It's so good. Mm, and then he does this little twirl thing with his hair. And that and he gets and found girl's out. girl's like, Whoosh, stop that. There you go, Bob. <laughs> not from the back. Am I right? I, I had missed what movie. I'm not completely awake. What movie was it? Let's just keep going. So after that scene, <laughs> the son gets kidnapped. And then no, no. snap. <laughs> what, what movie? <laughs> he rescues him. Sword fighting. Lots of sword fighting. Count him on a crystal. Do you oh, was. <laughs> okay. And that's it's ah uh, what actor is that? He's really fit. Henry Cavill. Yeah. It's a very young Henry Cavill. No, Jim. Huh? Jim. Jim Caviezel? Oh, the kid. The yeah, kid. Yeah, the kid is, is a young yeah. Henry yeah, Cavill. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, you're right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim Caviezel, he's such an amazing actor. He was so good in that movie. Do not uh do not commit the crime for which you now pay the price. Mm. Mm. Great wisdom there. Good stuff. And you know what he does with all that money? He buys that castle and they they like (laughs) get all the prisons out of there. It's a bad place. And he buys it. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a tough movie though, because the end is almost justifying revenge. Mm Mm-hmm. And it is a s I mean as as you watch it, it is sweet. Mm -hmm. You know, you this is every person's fantasy that Mm -hmm. they get a one up on the person that hurt them. Yep. But I don't know. Um, Does he ever show mercy? No, he sticks that sword right through Mm -hmm. his chest. So the book is so much more. The movie is amazing. I love the movie. It's a great adventure story. It's a great romp through the what if. And there's some really fun characters. Even yesterday, even yesterday, I was saying Zatara just... Zatara <laughs> sounds fearsome. It means driftwood. I just it's it's a thing that's just always in my head. I love that movie. And uh the book is so there's so much more content obviously, but there is an exploration into uh into mercy. That, have you read the book? I have, yeah. Oh, okay, that, you know, okay. That you don't get you don't get in the movie obviously because we have to tell this story in an hour and 45 minutes. And how do you condense a 900 page book into an hour and 45 minutes? Sure. So they're two completely different animals with the same title. Uh, and then a couple of the same characters, but, uh, there is a redemption story and it's not, it's not how the movie ends. Oh, really? Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't button up the family as nicely. It's just sort of a, Oh, that's they're not sad. all standing on the cliff no. with the yeah the no. ocean in the they, yeah. they both find uh, they both find forgiveness of one another. It's more like uh, 
Castaway. Mm. It ends more like Castaway. Mm. Where just kind of everybody everybody kind of gets to move on. Castaway has a frustrating ending. It but really, then yeah. also satisfying in some ways. Well, and then once again, there's other characters that... Um, that the count gets to encounter and it's it is it is satisfying but there is a mercy arc i've noticed this is a trend with a lot of the 19th century literature Mm -hmm. um the families don't end up all together and happy Mm -hmm. almost always that's a 20th century it's a nuclear family like a 1950s plus yeah sort of trope that we want we want everybody to be together but families were rent apart all the time it doesn't matter if it's little women or les mis or, or Little House on the Prairie? Yeah, or Little like, House on the Prairie. Crime and Punishment. Yeah. Did you ever read any of those? Oh, yeah. yeah. Did y'all have this horrible thing called the Accelerated Reading Program in school? The AR program? Did y'all oh, do that? Oh, wow. You just unlocked a core yeah. memory. I completely forgot about that. You had that? Yes. I hated that. I loved it. You are <sighs> different than I. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I read all the time when I was younger. Yeah. But... I like. I still like to read, but not just not as much. This this shows a a core personality trait for me. So my teacher required us to have so many points per six weeks to mm. get an A. You know, it's thirty five points to get an A, thirty to get a B, or whatever. You, man, you are bringing back all the memory uh-huh. right now. It's these horrible people. And if any of y'all are teachers, then I I demand apologies. Leave us a comment if you're <laughs> our age and you remember <laughs> AR program, because man, that it was the worst. And I gamed the system. This is me to a T. Uh, this is me with like Weight Watchers. This is, is the AR program. So there are 7,000 Hardy Boy books. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. And a Hardy Boy book was five points. Yes. Yes. I could read a Hardy Boy book in two days. <laughs> George is so lost right now. <laughs> I could read a Hardy Boy book in two days. And so in two days, I would read a Hardy Boy book and get five points yep. on the test. Just ace it. Bam. And then I would read seven of them. Well, my teacher got wise to this at Christmas. She goes, the only thing that you've read is Hardy Boy books. And I'm like, yeah, they're five points each. And I've got an entire semester's worth of books left, baby. You know, there's like 85 books in the whole sequence. And she goes, that's a reading level of, you know, sixth grade or whatever. You can't read anything less than a ninth grade reading level. So she did that to me. And I'm like, well, what's ninth grade reading level? And so that was the beginning of my anxiety in school. <laughs> the Bible. No, that's kidding. <laughs> well, it took me until about um, two years ago to finally finish the Bible. But um, so then the first book that I picked up was The Three Musketeers because mm-hmm. I love that movie uh, from the 90s. And so I read The Three Musketeers and I completely failed the test. And so I was going to make nothing on the – anyway, it was, it's, it was truly one of the beginning sources of anxiety for me in my life was mm. this insurmountable, like, I don't have, I can't read ninth grade. I'm in sixth grade, you know. It was, anyway. Well, I had to go to a special reading class and read all my books out loud because the teacher thought it was helpful while everyone else read Harry Potter very silently to themselves. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why Dick and Jane are together. It's just, it's annoying. <laughs> a little trauma, it's fine. <laughs> Justin unlocked a core memory for me and unlocked a <laughs> tragic memory for George. <laughs> That's a tragic memory for me. But now I love reading. So I could say Harry st- Potter. statistically, <laughs> two out of three people are traumatized by the AR reading program. So you take that with you, 67% of there us. You go. 67% of us hated the accelerated reading program. But real quick, I want to go back to Castaway because I love the ending. The first time I saw the movie, yeah. I, I thought it was trash, and I was so frustrated. Yeah, but then I saw it a couple more times. And I was like, "Man, this is like it's a very adult ending." Y- you want to well, you want to talk about like right choices and just good lessons overall at the end of it. Can you imagine going through something like that, and then at the end of it, finding out that everything you had completely known before was wiped away? It reminds me of the story of Job. Mm. Like he, everything was gone, mm-hmm. he, everything was done, and he couldn't. He didn't have his family anymore. He didn't have his wife. He didn't have his job. And obviously, he was taken care of. But that was the part that was really cool. He came back, and everything was essentially taken care of for him. And then the very end of it, where he drops off that package, and 
still frustrated to this day that I don't know what was inside the package, but I'm just going to let it go, you know, with the wings mm-hmm, on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he just goes on the road. He talks to the person that was at that farm and then she points him in the direction. He's like, cool, I'm going to go this way. And just new choice, new decision, like moving on in life. I, oh, I love that movie. Can't stand the tooth scene, but everything else about the movie is <laughs> great. Scene. Yeah, yeah. When he stops kind of at that crossroad mm-hmm. there, the dirt road. And yeah, we all have road, choices. It's that's up near Amarillo. Yes. Is it, it is. really? It is, yeah. What? They, they filmed it up there, yeah. Mm-hmm. Field trip. <laughs> let's, let's do our podcast there next time. I, I've been there. It's still, it still looks it's like still a just a dirt road. Yeah, it's just a dirt road. road. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. But we can recreate the scene. It looks much more beautiful in the movie. Though. I'll be Tom Hanks. I think my favorite, though, was we were in our honeymoon at Charleston, and we were taking this horse carriage ride with a bunch of other tourists. and like, yeah, yeah, look at that. And the tourist goes, and right there, we're – Going past a crosswalk, right there is where Ryan Gosling laid down on the scene in a notebook. Everyone took out their phones and took a picture of the concrete oh, yeah. immediately mm-hmm. because Ryan Gosling laid right there. Mm-hmm. You know, Meanwhile, all the cars are honking and driving by and wondering why you're on a horse-drawn carriage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> People are nostalgic about weird stuff. People, yeah, are weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People are weird. That I've There was a quote that Downton Abbey Rose and I are watching Downton Abbey and it was there's nothing as queer as folk there's nothing as strange as how people are behaving mm. Mm. that's just a saying and I was like oh that's weird mm. that's a that's an interesting saying I think it's a Welsh saying that says it's not as queer as folk mm. and I said what did she say and we rewound it, it says, it's not as queer as folk what you rewound it again and then we had to put on the subtitles <laughs> And then I said, oh, and then I Googled it. I said, oh, there's nothing as strange as people. Got it. Julie can't understand British English, so we always have the subtitles on. That's Almost funny. always, yeah. It's become a norm. So you saw my show. Oh, I did. The Camelot. Did my accent, was it okay? As oh, I thought you were great. Okay. Excellent. Okay. The um, accent, though. I was worried about the accent. No, I, th- I thought you were super. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, your performance was, was great. The story was great. Um. Yeah, it's an interesting tale. I I think redemption's kind of on my mind, but um, it's it's kind of a it's a story. Uh, Camelot, the musical, it's a story of, I guess, a king who is really just sort of built up with as much knowledge as possible, and then he makes a decision to sort of change the world, sort of at that crossroads. I'm gonna go this way, and. It's kind of clunky now, sort of to our taste for storytelling, but in the early 60s, I'm sure it was very grand and very beautiful, and it helped to have Richard Burton and Richard Harris do it. But um, How did you get out of the invisible box? Um, that's a good question. Well, because you remember they, uh, they enticed uh, I had to Mordred. take a little girl, my daughter, to uh-huh. the bathroom. <laughs> and that you don't see it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I so was like, Mordred entices Morgan Le Fay to put Arthur in an invisible shelter for the night. Oh, okay. And so then the next scene that I'm on stage is that uh, that sequence, Guinevere, where, you know, it's like a, what's that, a montage? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's a montage sequence. Anyway. That was really good. Oh, I liked how um, you had Aragorn's sword. It was awesome. <laughs> I was it. like, oh, I know that sword. <laughs> <laughs> From she, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. It 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 wasn't actually the sword, but it looked a lot like it. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, okay. But it didn't have like the hollow pommel or whatever. But um uh, it was neat to kind of play that character. And I love that story because he actually becomes a more righteous character. And you actually see at the end of Act One, you see that that decision that he's making where you get to hear him think, which is probably I tried to keep it up B and it helped that it was underscored. But um, to have a position of authority where you basically have the right to do whatever you want uh, and then choose righteousness and forgiveness or to even allow people that he loves to undermine him. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really helpful to me looking at Christ and how he allows us to have our own choices, but then as always, they're welcoming us back. And there is forgiveness there. There is understanding and there is redemption. And that doesn't mean that we take advantage of it. But it's the same thing with Account of Monte Cristo where do we take revenge into our own hands? Yeah. But then um, it's, it's one of those really advanced 
sort of theories whenever you're talking about Christendom that no matter what you've done, you have the ability to come back. You can return like the prodigal son. Yeah, that is true. And it's hard to talk about because we can imagine, we because humans are the inventors of evil, we can imagine some pretty horrific stuff. Mm-hmm. And we have even accounts within the last hundred years of humans doing the most atrocious and diabolical and destructive things to one another. You know, I mean, you're talking millions of people who've, well, tens of millions now that with you take accounts to like the first and second world wars, how many millions of people died. And it makes sense that the last 60, 70 years, there's like a divide. No, you're too evil. We don't talk about you. You know, we it's uncomfortable to talk about, but it's good to bring that up and say, on the pages of the New Testament, Jesus offers forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness of the sins that you've committed. And that in return, he asks that you repent, that you do those things no more. Much like when Jesus said that to the adulteress who was caught in adultery. Mm-hmm. John 8? Yes, six. good job. John 8. John mm-hmm. 8. I took a stab at 8, and it was great. Um, so John 8, and that's one of the most telling sentences. It's like this woman's caught in adultery. The old law literally says, if caught in adultery and there are two, more than two witnesses, you take those people out and you stone them. It's like justice. Mm-hmm. You, you, you root that out of your people. And here's Jesus fulfilling the law and saying, no, I have, I am God. I'm, I have the right to forgive sins. I don't accuse you. Go and sin no more. And that's what he says to us. That's one of my favorite because he seems to somehow sum up <laughs> like the scriptures and the reason why Jesus is there mm-hmm. in word and deed. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, like bypass the law mm-hmm. in ways. And so, yeah, I, it's, um, I'll go one like further. That should be the gospel message. And, and you're exactly right. Yeah. And I'll even go one further and say that I was shocked at my more recent studies of Paul because Saul of Tarsus, when he says that he wreaked havoc of the church, he did so much destruction. Mm-hmm. He did so much destruction that in Acts 2, 3, and 4, whenever we're talking about the saints gathered together in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. we're talking thousands of people thousands. who assembled in their city all worshiping and proclaiming Christ and, and living together in this sort of Sir Thomas More's utopian society. They're sharing all their belongings. I sell my land and make sure that no one is, has need of anything. And then they appoint the deacons, and then uh, Stephen goes to his death, re- mm-hmm. like rebuking the people who would do him harm, and they stone yeah. him, and there's Saul of Tarsus. And then Saul of Tarsus, with almost like a letter of Mark from the high priest, he goes and wreaks havoc of the church, so much so that the church disperses. Mm. They were scattered because of their fear of Saul of Tarsus. So it doesn't tell us what he did, but I can imagine, because I'm a human and I can invent a lot of evil in my mind, I can imagine what Paul did. Yeah. He, he says it in some of his accounts. No, he I, alludes I, to it, yeah. I hailed men and women, I had them in the synagogues, and I, I, ca- I wanted them to blaspheme. So how do you do that? Trick them into doing that, and then like coursing them into doing that. And... I think it's exactly what you read about in the Chronicles and what you read about in the, in the Kings books, mm-hmm. where... Yeah, it's like you take your you take the children of other people and you torture the children in front of their parents. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's possible. I, it's it doesn't say it, but I'm just thinking you do you do the most atrocious things to people. Uh, and I remember there was this book I read in college called mm-hmm. the um, oh something of Herodes. Ah, see, it's been so long. My retention's failing me. It's a white book. It has a column on it. And it's a Grecian account of a trial. Like it, it was a public document of a trial of uh, this murder or that, that had happened. And they took several of these slaves who didn't have the, the social caste as other people. Mm-hmm. And in the de- democratic society of the Greeks, slaves didn't have certain rights. 
and it was it was not only socially but it was politically acceptable to torture slaves to get a, t a testimony out of them it's like hey did this happen and they say no it didn't happen and then they would torture them mm. until they gave whatever they testimony wanted. they wanted yeah and that's the whole point about torturing people it's like if you torture people they're going to say whatever they need to say to get the torturing to stop which is horrible but then i i immediately think of saul of tarsus who's like i wanted them to blaspheme against god i wanted them to do what job never did and you just cause them un, unrivaled pain you look them dead in the eye and you kill their family members in front of them slowly painfully. in his mind you know that was heresy and he's and he was standing up for the justified. law and yeah he was a hebrew of hebrews mm -hmm. and trying to do what was right and he believed still worshiping god um and is that worse is i mean is that worse than stealing a pack of gum from the store well there's certainly different consequences sure but um Sin is going to leave a stain, and it's still something that we need to repent from. And when Paul did repent. And I don't know if it should equal the same amount of guilt, like not, not surely guilt, but the, maybe the guilt that that person feels mm -hmm. um, is going to be different. I was thinking of King Manasseh. Is that right? I have it pulled up. Mm, I'm teaching on him here soon. Manasseh, uh, one of the tribes. Manasseh, yeah, Manasseh. M A N A S S E H. Oh, Manasseh. Okay. I think it is also close to a tribe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he does a bunch of evil, mm. um, you know, uh, super bad stuff. I, I haven't read it in a while, but like you know, making sacrifices and worshiping yeah. to. That's what they did. Yeah worshiping to idols and I want to talk about sacrifices like child sacrifices things like that mm -hmm. and then at the end he actually repents like he reigns for a really long time longer mm -hmm. than anyone else and then at the very end he repents and God uh, forgives him mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty awesome redemption story mm -hmm. but I mean he's known as a horrible bad king and in many ways he's a horrible bad king but he's actually in God's eyes, he's good mm -hmm. right now. And so he's, he's in some ways a good king as well. And it's kind of a paradox. Mm -hmm. um, and all it is is you're relying on on uh, God and, and his justice. It's said that throughout the whole Old Testament. But I think this is why Paul, for example, says in Romans 12, verse 19, right, the famous, um, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay says the Lord. Um, he turned that around um, and realized his own faults. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. Oh, well, he carries that with him. You were going to say something. Oh, no, I just had a thought. Um, I hadn't really thought about it until just now when we were talking about, you mentioned consequences. Mm -hmm. And I think for us as humans, the example that you're using, Justin, if... I murdered somebody, but then I also stole a pencil. What's the natural tendency that you want to say is worse? Well, yeah, obviously the murder. You murdered someone. Yeah. So when we think about it as just human beings, we see the actual consequences of what happens when you murder somebody, like prison or death row or you're, you're you know, killed. Um, th there's a lot of different things that we are able to see visibly but I think that's the part that sometimes we can struggle with when we're trying to justify sin or when we're thinking about what's worse versus not worse as well. And if we can be forgiven for certain things or not, if I lied and that's a consistent thing that I do and be like, well, I'm not murdering somebody. It's really not that bad. But I mean, sin mm -hmm. is sin. We already yeah. clarified that. But it's interesting to think about that no matter what you've done, God can and will forgive you with a repentant heart. Uh, but it it's, I don't know. It's just something, it, it's a little bit humbling just to think about like sin is sin. And it, it, it's easy for myself and I think maybe other people as well to have a tendency to try to justify smaller things that don't seem like that it could be worse than murder or anything like that. You know what I mean? Um, cause you, you 
when you said consequences, it just kind of got the ball rolling of thinking about like sin is sin, but sometimes it's easy for us to just push little things and not really yeah. think about them as much rather than the bigger things. I'm thinking of an analogy that just came out of my head and it's probably trash, but um, don't, I haven't. What? Stop. <laughs> no. Stop. You don't get to do that to yourself. Well, I haven't thought I'm it through. I'm, I'm going to do this one on air. <laughs> don't do that to well, yourself. Imagine a white sheet um, and you have a white sheet and you, you steal something, you know, something small like you had mentioned before. I mean, that is just a dot of ink, mm. uh, permanent ink on that sheet. Mm -hmm. But if you murder, I mean, someone has just thrown the paint bucket on mm -hmm. this sheet, right? That's how we kind of view the sin and the consequences of that sin. Either way, it's still a stain. Sometimes that dot could be just as um, maybe even more irritating mm -hmm. <laughs> than the huge paint bucket. Mm -hmm. It's like really hard to embrace just this dot that's been there forever. But it honestly, it just doesn't matter because the blood of Christ washes that clean. I think that's why it's so important for everyone. You can never make that as white as it was before. Mm -hmm. But this is why it's so important to be with Jesus because when you're with Jesus, it is white as snow, right? That's beautiful. Um, that's true. So just as we have to let the power of Christ cleanse that sheep, perhaps. We need to let that same power work out some of the vengeance and anger maybe we're feeling as well. Um, just kind of tie both of the per, um, conversations that we're having together. But I, I don't know. That, that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, that, that's such a good point, and I wish that I had said my thing first because mine is not as good as that. Um, in the old law, this is something that's been on my mind, there's actually restrictions for ovens in the old law. Mm -mm. Are you recalling this at all? So there's there's uh, there's like a a sequences of you have to make a new oven, you have to fire it a certain way, and then you the priest would bless it, and then if it ever became corrupted or leprosy ever entered the house or disease or what have you, the instruction from the old law is to take the oven and destroy it. Mm. And then make a new one. Yeah. Which practically it makes sense. You don't want to cook food and something that's rancid or what have you. And so, okay, the old law, done. But then we talk about redemption and cleanliness. You know, there's lots of cleansing rituals and stuff that's in the old law where it washed things with water and yada yada. And Jesus even alludes to that. Like, you are a tomb of rotting corpses, but outside you're white. And wash the inside of the bowl. That way the outside may be clean as well. So there's all of these sayings that keep happening um, that illustrate this point of redemption and cleanliness. But I always go back to that oven that you have to break, which mm -hmm. I thought was just odd. It's like, huh, that's an interesting law to say. Uh, and so I, I'll go one further. I won't go as far as, um, as my mind came up with because it's pretty horrible <laughs> what I'll say. Uh, but I'm not going to say it here. I might say it after the recording. But I'll go a little tamer. Are you familiar with the musical Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street? Mm -hmm. My friend. Okay. So <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, I, so short. I, I love that. I love that movie or that musical. Um, the movie's fine too. But in, essentially in the story, they kill people, right? Yeah. So murder, it's bad. We've been talking about murder, bad. so it's not anything new. That's bad. We condemn that. Uh, and then... To get rid of the bodies, instead of going and burying them somewhere, they, whoo, brace yourselves, adult, they cook them into meat pies, and then they serve them to the people of London. Sure. And so this is a really horrible, macabre sort of story. Uh, and then I'm thinking, what about that oven? What about that oven that they use in that play, uh, in that story, to cook the meat pies? It's soiled now, right? Is it ever possible to clean that oven enough to where you would be able to just eat normal food out of it again for it to be untainted. Mm -hmm. Man, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to eat out of that. Right. Right. Um, yeah, no, thank you. So then that's sort of the illustration of there. We as humans recognize that there is a line that once crossed, you can't come back. But that's not what is offered on the pages of the New Testament. So I just, I don't know if I want to go here either. Uh, we're getting to some weird places. We can cut it out, but. 
Sure. The redemption stuff is good. Anyway, I was reading just this morning, a few minutes ago, uh, Ezekiel, and I got to chapter four and on, on your oven analogy. Have you seen? Have you heard this? Read this? Ezekiel four. Yeah. Anyway, it's been since last year. Ezekiel was one of those books where I'm like, I guess I'm finally reading Ezekiel. Ooh, that was a weird ride. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Yeah, you're either you you come away. What you should do is you come away understanding how bad sin is to God, mm. or you come away just really ticked off and maybe both anyway chapter 4 verse 9 and uh, Ezekiel here is demonstrating what um, giving an example living an example of what the punishment will be like because of Israel's sin or Judah's sin Um, it says and you take wheat barley and beans and lentils verse 9 and put them in a single vessel and, and make your bread from them during the number of days that you lie on your side 390 you shall eat it and your food um, that you eat shall be weighed 20 shekels he goes on and on and drink in verse 12 verse 13 and the lord said um, thus shall the people of israel eat their bread unclean among the nations um, when i drive them uh let's see oh Verse 12, I missed verse 12. And you shall eat of the barley cake, this is the point, baking it in their sight on human dung. Okay, there's that idea of what you were talking about, Sweeney Todd in the oven, how unclean it is. And then God says, this is how unclean it is. This is what sin is like to me, yeah. Um, it's like you're, you're eating food cooked on this human dung. Mm-hmm. Um, it's It just leaves... It, you may not realize it. You may still be eating it and thinking it's fine, but it's just eventually it's going to make you sick. It's unclean. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. Where's Ezekiel 4? Behold, I've never been defiled. Yeah. Peter, the, Peter says that. Whoa, I just made that connection. But I said, oh, Lord God, behold, I've never been defiled. From my youth until now, I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts nor has any unclean meat ever entered my mouth. Peter says that. Mm-hmm. He does say that. In the book of Acts. Yeah. When that sheet comes down and all that. See, I, I will give you cow's dung in place of human dung over which you will prepare your bread. <laughs> Behold, I'm going to break the staff of bread in Jerusalem. And they will eat bread by weight and with anxiety. Ugh, and drink water by weight and with anxiety. Um, it's It's fascinating... Because there is an obvious difference um, that God talks about in the Bible where God allows, uh, I guess, more leniency that, than humans would. And so it's, it sort of reflects what David says in Second Samuel or, he's, or First Samuel when he says, uh, let me fall into the hands of the Lord because the Lord is more merciful than man. Mm-hmm. And... Um, those are great things to explore and to hope in that, you know, even though you may have made a choice, I know I've made choices I wish that I could take back, uh, as we all have. I think that's what equalizes us in the eyes of God. But then the idea is that there is a way to come back to him and he wants us to, and that we as humans, we change our mindset so that we're able to understand that God wants all men to come to repentance and he's patient and long suffering. And if we don't allow that, then we fall victim as the same parable workers of the field who, uh, they get their day's wage, but then the people who come at the end of the day, they get their wage too. That's Jesus says, that's like the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And that, that the people who had been working all day were grumbling, but rather they should have been rejoicing that mm-hmm. more people could have come and have received the wage. And the, the idea is salvation, that if you've worked your whole life for salvation and someone enters the kingdom right before they depart from this coil, um, you shouldn't feel bad for the fact that you've worked longer. You should rejoice with the fact that they're able to receive the same blessing. You're right. So it's a, it's a change in mindset. and uh, Actually being happy for someone else. Precisely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that happiness starts with you. You're, I'm happy because I understand. And that's, that's talked about all the time in the New Testament. That's the maturing. Once you're able to tune your mind to God's thinking, mm-hmm. 
the worldly thinking just is kind of put away. You put aside the old man, renew your minds in the things that God has you to do. And so this new mindset is how you look at life. You're able to walk through the life. I mean, you're still paying your taxes. You still fill up gas in your car. You still have to prepare food for your fi- your friends and your family. But you have that different mindset of, huh, you know what? That doesn't matter as much anymore as much as this matters. Yeah. I guess even in my sermon Sunday, I was surprised studying Philippians chapter 3 where Paul is basically saying, look, I am not perfect, and I mess up. And just thinking, wow, he's kind of nearing the end of his life there, and I'm like, wow, he just admits that he messes up and there's still room for growth. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's encouraging, even though he's cleansed mm-hmm. through Jesus. And I think that's kind of the takeaway. Um, if you are thinking about some of the things you've done in your past, First John 1, 9 tells us, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, forgiving us of our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. So the idea of cleansing us. Um, If we say, and of course we say we haven't sinned, um, that's not true, we're a liar, right? right? And so all of us have, and it's just admitting that and taking responsibility. Uh, And taking responsibility is the first step to getting better. That's right. But we got to do it on the power of God, not our own power. So there you go. Uh, Go south. If you want to know more about the Bible or you have any questions, our email is in the description below. You can DM us. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're looking for a church family or you're in the Lubbock area, we invite you to come visit and hang out with us in Milwaukee. We love for you to find a church who practices the love of Christ.